Good evening and, and welcome to everybody. This is uh, for you who are visiting us. This is the eighth session this year of, of the um, seminar of the Chair in Geopolitics uh, in Risk. It's entitled this year, Ethique de l'incertitude, the ethics of uncertainty. And uh, this evening, we are going to be focusing, focusing on new forms of social science practice inspired by um, the concepts and, and even practices of quantum theory. Uh, our guests are professors Karen O'Brien and Laura Zanotti, with whom I'll introduce you in just a moment. You will have noticed that the session is happening in English, uh, which can be nice for some and less uh, nice for others. Just rest assured that if you have comments or questions, you can pose them as usual in in French, um, either orally and by raising your hand, or by in the chat uh, as you as you like. Um, and as usual, I encourage you and ask you by courtesy to leave your cameras on so that our guests can see you and uh, uh, associate what they're saying with uh, with your reactions. It makes things a lot easier for a teacher. I can I can tell you. Also, as usual, we'll start by a little a brief look back at um, at what happened last week. We talked. Um, as you might remember, um, about the politics and ethics of uncertainty, that uncertainty, that particular kind of uncertainty generated, uh, and in some cases contributing to the pandemic of COVID-19, which is on everybody's uh, mind. We tried to open it up a little bit in terms of um, the uh, uncertainties in medical practices and the uncertainties in the managing truth, the sort of fake news problematic. Yeah. You remember that according to Sylvie Brion of the WHO, the, the, the vectors of uncertainty that she and her team work with are multiple and overlapping, really. Here are a few examples that she, she named for us. One was the sort of crisscrossing, let's call it imbricated, imbricated way, to use a French word, that um, predictions and the governance of the pandemic are not in sync. And they're, they're out of sync, and this out of sync uh, reality complicates things even more. So you have on one, one hand the, the predictions that are, that are necessary not only for epidemiological purposes, but for political purposes directly. We see it every day on the news and in the practices of our governments. And then the way they're governed, uh, they can never be quite in sync, and this makes life difficult not only for the WHO, but for all national health authorities as, as well. And then another complication is that the evolution of the pandemic, of the, of the disease itself, takes place at a different speed than that of the ability to give diagnoses. And this was causing another level of complexity for, for the WHO. Third example she gave, the virus itself is changing and changing and obviously at a different speed than the science of epidemiology. Fourthly, the technologies of medical surveillance are evolving and it's hard to keep up with them. The way we can watch what's going on in the, in the um, epidemic. And then I think the last example she gave was the, uh, which surprised me, was the zoonotic disequilibrium, she called that. So there's still a back and forth passage between humans and animals, even though, even beyond the original one that we, we sort of uh, make a myth mythology out, out of. And this this uh, instability is complicating the ability to create uh, health policies that are long-standing and, and, and effective. And then finally, the, a point she made at the end, I, just to remind you that the social adaptations that we're making, the way we live, essentially, vis-a-vis um, -vis the um, individual ethical measures we're invited to take by, by our governments, but also by, by health officials and just the, the, the local social norms, are complex and not in sync uh, either. So all these uncertainties, essentially uh, aligned by, uh, underlined, sorry, by, by Sylvie Brand, uh, contributed to the second analysis we had, which was by Jean-Pierre Dupuis, about what he called the relation between catastrophe and false reasoning about catastrophe. So to simplify it beyond uh, what he deserves, uh, he talked to us about fake news and the way it's, the way it's impacting the, the, the pandemic. So he was focused on the difference between sophism, which is ideological, and sophism, which, which is plain and simple, just getting it wrong. And the way that, that the, the, the 
the bad sync between these two creates a certain kind of um, risk. And then we ended the session, you might remember, talking about, about Bergson, the French philosopher from the beginning of the 20th century, and his really quite uh, prosaic reflection that the possible, as he put it, the possible can only become actual when it's been realized mentally or in our imaginations. And that opened a discussion, you remember, about Im imagining futures, future, futurology, and the, the degree to which it depends on uh, artistic creation and, uh, and fantasy and science fiction. And then we found that there was a link be between the way that AXA insurance company, our, our sponsor actually, and uh, the WHO of all places, does, has a methodology of futurology based on poetry and imaginative writing. So enough about this. Let's turn to the theme for this evening and ask maybe how can the tools and concepts of um, quantum theory contribute to our thinking about ethics of uncertainty? Quantum mechanics, for you who don't know, and we'll hear a bit more uh, in detail about this in a moment, it's of course a set of theories formulated at the beginning of the 20th century, really in a way provoked by um, the fact that the technological methods we had for observing the physical phenomena were outpacing the theories that we had to explain them. So we could suddenly observe things uh, <laughs> uh, in, in, in laboratory settings, which could not be no, no, no longer be explained by the classical uh, physical um, theories. And when the theory came out and started to be, and now has started to be tested, we see that it really has profound ontological assumptions. That means that it really challenges the way we see the world, what we think the world is, what we think reality is. Physical reality, of course, but also social reality, which is our, which is our, um, which is our theme for this evening. It problematizes the relation between objects, um, the nature of space, the symmetry of physical laws, and the predictability of, of things, how much we can predict what will happen if we take certain actions. And this is important for studying the physical world, but also for studying and acting in the, the, the social world. Um, and maybe one of the most relevant methodological characteristics of quantum theory is that it no longer describes the world in physical terms. It doesn't say that this object is there, or that this object will arrive at this time, but rather it, it describes it in prob probabilistic terms. It's, it's, it paints a picture of the probability of it, this object being here or that uh, event happening uh, a bit later on. What is called quantum social sciences, which is really getting closer uh, to what we're talking about here today, is of course far more recent, really quite recent, and uh, not known uh, as not quite as famous as quantum theory in the physical sciences, uh, uh, you can, you, you'll see. It's inspired in some ways by the philosophical conversations of the original quantum physicists like Niels Bohr or Heisenberg or Schrodinger. They were really quite philosophical in their reflection about what this all meant about the world and reality and society and, and not the least ethics. But it wasn't until around the 1990s when a couple of popularizing uh, works came out, it, it became, it was taken up in the cognitive sciences to try to make a match between the way we're cognitively understanding the world and what's actually happening in the, in our brains and ourselves in the, in our brains. And in the 2000s, it became uh, more widespread. We're careening towards the present now, as you understand. But in, to, to summarize, and I don't want to take the thunder from our guests, the, these quantum principles from the early 20th century have made it possible to simply ask some questions about the assumptions we make uh, about the relationship between human beings and matter, about agency, about causality, what, what events cause other events and what's the relation, what's the status of that causality, among an, a number of other uh, uh, types of questions we can ask, and we'll, we'll hear more about that in, in a moment. And all of these concepts in this new version of quantum theory called quantum social science is deeply connected to understanding people in society, the agency they feel, the ethics they express, their relation to, to the world, to reality, to matter, and the causality they're capable of exerting on the, on, on the world if they so choose to. And these are, of course, core questions for transformation, 
social change and, and the political dimension of understanding society at large. But enough of that, enough of me in any case, let's now uh, turn to our guests um, this evening. Professor Laura Zanotti is a uh, professor of political science at Virginia Tech University. And there she teaches and researches uh, critical political theory, international organizations, UN peacekeeping, and the role of NGOs in post-conflict governance. Before she became an academic, she worked at the UN where she served both at, in the administration as, and, and as a political officer for uh, peacekeeping operations. She spent actually several years in the field, both in Haiti and in Croatia, where she held in the latter the post of deputy, head, deputy to the head of the UN li liaison office in Zagreb. But more recently, and more interesting for us today, she's published uh, a number of really quite pioneering works on quantum theory and the social and human sciences. She's really one of the leaders in this field. And we're very, very lucky to, to, to have her here. Among these works is her 2019 book entitled Ontological Entanglements, Agency and Ethics in International Relations, Exploring the Crossroads. You'll find the reference in, the, in our bibliography in the resources uh, folder and a link to the book. Uh, the book addresses the implications of applying quantum physics uh, uh, and the quantum physics notion of entanglement, entangled, entangled ontology, to the concepts of agency and ethics. And I'm sure we'll hear more about this. There's also a second work, an, an article, which is more recent and, and uh, a bit more philosophical, which I've enjoyed very much in my own work, Decolonizing the Political Ontology of Kantian Critiques, sorry, Kantian Ethics, a Quantum Perspective. It's published in the Journal of International Political Theory. And it is actually in the Dropbox and on the bibliography. So you, you're, I invite you to, to look at that. Karen O'Brien is professor in the Department of Sociology and Human Geography at the University of Oslo in Norway. She's also co-founder of Sea Change, an organization that links research with action to empower individuals and groups with the knowledge, skills, and tools to generate ethical and sustainable transformation. And otherwise, her research emphasizes the social and human dimensions of climate change, including the relationship between climate change adaptation and transformations to sustainability, subjects that she'll address um, this evening, I'm quite sure. Otherwise, she focuses in her work on the role of beliefs, values, worldviews, and paradigms in generating conscious social change, very much like in uh, my own work, as you know, as you've heard uh, many times over which is why I'm also very pleased and honored that she would join us tonight. Among her recent books, actually very, very, very recent, is You Matter More Than You Think, playing, of course, on the word matter, matter being important, but also having a material impact on the world in the same way that uh, Butler does in her um, uh, work, Bodies That Matter, same play. Sorry, matters, you matter more than you think, quantum social change for a thriving world and, complain, and Climate and Society, Transforming the Future, co-authored with Robin Leichenko. She has been named, I learned uh, this morning, by Web of Science as one of the world's most influential researchers of the past decade, really quite remarkable. And in 20, uh, 20, 000, uh, 2021, I'm sorry, she was co-recipient of the BBVA Foundation Frontiers, Foundation's Frontiers of Knowledge Award for Climate Change. So we're really very uh, fortunate tonight to have these two um, speakers, and I won't waste any more of their time and, and uh, give the floor to them. We've decided that, as usual, that we'll try to target 30, 35 minutes for presentation, leaving time for your own input and, and questions, which I, I welcome very much, and a discussion amongst the three of us. And by toss of the coin, no, I'm joking, we decided that Laura would, uh, would begin with her presentation. The floor is yours, Laura, thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for this uh, very nice introduction. Um, I will start sharing my screen. I have a few slides um, to make my argument maybe more readable and easier to follow. So um, this is now. Okay, and as you uh, as you can see, the words that um, that 
Professor Burgess had just shared with us, uh, the notion of uncertainty, uh, the notion of imagination and the notions of complexity will be um, at the very relevant for, for my discussion and my presentation tonight. Uh, the title, in a somewhat pro provocative manner, um, is The Moral Failure of the Quest for Certainty, Rethinking Ethics and Agency Through a Quantum Ontological Critique. Um, and in this talk, I will merge together some of the arguments of my book uh, that uh, uh, Peter has mentioned a moment ago, and uh, some of the arguments that are in the latest article about decolonizing Kant. So, uh, Scholars of ethics ask themselves, like uh, Shapkot, for instance, recently, uh, how we can uh, decide which ethics should apply in what context in a complex world. What is a universal truth and what kind of ethics applies where are themselves ethical dilemmas. Um, in ethics, so is that in the question that arise in this regard is about the grounding of ethics, right? Um, Kantian deontological thought has tried to root ethics on uh, uh, universal laws, uh, whereas more recent critics of recent critics like Derrida, postmodernist critiques, have, has argues that, have argued that ethics always exceed the law and occupies a space of undecidability. Um, so is morality based upon duties that hold regardless of circumstances um, or is linked um, to also to considerations of means to hands and possible consequences that our action can generate. So substantialist and entangled ontological imaginaries nurture different answers to these questions. And I will try to explain what these imaginaries, and I use the word, the word imaginaries deliberately. I will try to explain later on what uh, these imaginaries uh, basically hold. Um, the main uh, stakes of this talk is an inquiry about the possibility of embracing, um, of imagining ethics without embracing the Kantian dualistic idea of nature and reason. Could we imagine subject in not as simply individuals programmed to pursue self-interest, which is one of the main assumption of realism and economic liberalism, what if instead of imagining the universe as a manifestation of a master plan governed by a deity, we think of the universe as an unfolding uh, whole and of ourselves as responsible for the cascade effects that uh, we may produce? And what if we embrace uncertainty, a word that uh, uh, Peter Berger has uttered many times in his introduction, as the main ontological trait of the world instead of certainty? as the foundation of how we think and how we act. Okay. Um, so in this slide, I will try to, um, in this slide and in this presentation, I will try to start by um, operating a quantum ontological critique of Kantian ethics. And uh, um, I will start by exploring the relevance of ontological assumption for justification of agency. Um, exploring, and I will explore the Kantian, Kantian ethic reliance on the ontological imaginary of Newtonian physics. Um, and I will end up by arguing that Kantian abstractions are not only insufficient to make good ethical choices, but also they are conducive to making the wrong one. And possibly they elicit self appeasement. Uh, the language that I will comment upon uh, later on is the language of unintended consequences as a currency for excuses, uh, for instance, for justified, justifying failed international interventions. Uh, as opposed to this kind of foundation of ethics, I argue that a quantum ontological imaginary validates ethical choices through contextual evaluation and specific practices rather than abstract humanity are the refer referent for devising and justifying su such an ethos. Um, so, and here I have to tell how I got interested in quantum. <laughs> and uh, I think that, that Peter has already said something about this, but I want to stop on this for a moment because my interest is not purely abstract or purely philosophical. It, it actually came, uh, became 
came to me as a result of my frustration as 10 years as a peacekeeper. Um, so my frustrations concerned mostly the justification of intervention based upon abstract normativity as an easy political currency, the use of standardized approach to peace building, assuming that strategies that worked in one place would work in the same manner in different, very different geographical areas and political situation, the neglect of contextual analysis um, of situations where we intervene, um, sketchy assessment of tools, the means to end, were very rarely um, talked about in, 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 you know, in depth. And, um, and as I mentioned before, the language of unintended consequences is a way of relinquishing responsibility for gross failures. Um, and I, I see these shortcomings as being in a way based upon assumptions, unthought about assumptions about that assume that the world is a Newtonian space, that causality and the world works along the lines of Newtonian physics. And that will explain why I make this statement. So first of all, I should say that uh, I want to use, I use quantum here as a critical onto epistemology. And uh, the starting points of my position are the scientific discourses are not a separate sphere of society. They are actually part of social cultures. Scientific discourses also contribute to shape ontologies and causal stories. Ontologies are political and causal stories are political. And as I go in this talk, I will, I will define more of these concepts and feel free to ask, uh, to ask questions. Um, so in my 2019 book, which is deeply inspired, inspired by the work of Karen Barad, um, I explore the performative effects of adopting a quantum ontological imaginary for thinking politics and ethics. Um, and in that book, I, you know, I recognize, I start by arguing that ontological imaginaries shape how we think of ourselves as subjects how we relate to other living and non-living beings, how we can study the world and how we can change it. Um, in fact, the ontological imaginaries shape our political and research practices and how we validate them. Um, so what are the main um, ontological assumption on Newtonian uh, mechanistic imaginaries? <laughs> Galileo and Newton, scientific knowledge limits its attention to properties that can be measured through instruments and expressed through mathematical formulas. The world is considered as made, is considered as made of entities and the instrument we use to measure the world do not change what we observe. That is, they don't entail ontological effect. They are just instruments that allow us to access a reality that we don't interact with. Um, we observe from afar. We are not part of the reality we observe. Newtonian physics is based upon the principle of separability. Uh, mechanicism is, is based upon the idea that in order to know things, we need to dissect them in subunits. And causality in Newtonian physics is linear and reversible. Um, so this ontoepistemology has extended to social sciences in various ways. You know, in my book, I analyze how it has informed different schools of international relation theories, but I will not dwell in, in that argument right now. What I want to point out here is that uh, um, the, you know, the, the ontological, this ontological assumption has nurtured the idea that the social world can be governed, governed and reproduced at will as a mechanism. And in time of complexity, many interconnections and uncertainty, um, this has proven increasingly a false premise. Uh, there is an interesting article that I wanted to refer to here by Samuel Barkin called Fish and International Relations which has shown that uh, um, a complex and interconnected world like the oceans and life in oceans cannot be known and governed through institution based upon separabilities and linear causality assumptions. You know, the, the institutions that govern fisheries are state-based and they don't consider the, the sea life as a whole, but they consider just parts of it as separate elements of, of a mechanism and that is proven not working. 
Um, but this could be a metaphor for many other, um, many other phenomena um, that we use the wrong tools to try to analyze or, or, or affect. Okay, so um, differently from Newtonian physics, quantum theories, um, ontology of entanglement, relationality, and nonlinear causality depicts a different cosmology. Um, depicts a different cosmology. In fact, um, it opens the way for the, think, the thinking how the universe is made and how we inhabit it. Um, in this view, the apparatuses of observation we use to observe and interact or interact with the world produce ontological effect. They're not merely, merely instruments of observation. Um, so the world is not made of entities that pre-exist the apparatuses that are used to study them, but it's made of phenomena. The primary, so for Karen Barad and for Bohr, the, the primary ontological referent are entanglement. And the interaction, and Barad talks about interaction because the word interaction would pres presuppose distinct entities to start up with, Karad chooses to, to use the word interaction uh, between the apparatus and the phenomenon as what is, the, is, is what produces the ontological cut. That is the specific form of materialization of matter. A typical example of this that is always um, used to explain this notion is the particle wave duality in observing uh, the behavior of electrons. And I will not dwell in that experiment right now, but you know, with different apparatuses of observation, uh, we seem to have different uh, behavior that belong to particles or waves. And so Barad spends a lot of time analyzing this experiment and other experiments. And she argues that in fact, our in interagency with the universe produces a specific form of mater materialization of matter. But we are not the only one, we're not the linear causal, causal um, factors that produce this kind of uh, ontological cut. Matter itself has agency. So matter as there are only certain possibilities that we can bring about, but the way we in, interact with reality makes what is different and causes and causes um, and causes um, cascade effect. So apparatuses are co causally relevant; they're not just instrument of observation. Matter matters in observing the world we make it, and the world make in turn makes us in turn. And um, in this framework, the choice of apparatuses we use to engage with the world is fundamental. It's an ethical problem. Uh, it must be made responsible. It must be made responsibly. Now, um, before I go to the next slide, I want to uh, make sure that uh, the notion of apparatus, you may be familiar with the notion of dispositive that has been, um, that has been uh, uh, very um, at the center of Foucault, um, you know, uh, work. And uh, the notion of apparatus here is used exactly in the same way. Uh, dispositives are an assemblage of knowledge, uh, physical constructions, power that structures subjectivity and social relations. Okay, uh, so my next move is to, um, to go into more details about what are the underpinning of our Western ethics. So uh, Kant um, assumptions, Kantian ethics assumptions about subjectivity uh, presuppose that we are ontologically separated inside and out, that we are divided between reason and nature nature being the source of selfish instincts, while ethical behavior only results from being able to detach ourselves from this nature. Reason is what potentially frees humans from nature's constraints and make them closer to God. And as you see, these are substantialist assumption about subjectivity. We start with the idea that the subject, we are made in a certain way, uh, that we are driven by nature to be selfish, to be maximizing whatever function of self-interest we may want to imagine. And 
you know, as you may um, notice, uh, this kind of assumption shape a lot of reflection about the rules of conflict, the functioning of the economy, and the way peace, justice, and development may be brought about. And we can, you know, talk more about this in 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 the conversation. Um, so um, also the Kantian um, ontological, the Kantian categorical imperative act as if the maxims of your action were to become through your will a universal law of nature. <laughs> they are actually based upon the assumption that as humans, we inhabit a homogeneous space where the same causal inferences may be drawn regardless of concept, context. And this is you know, uh, very much in, in line with the ontological, substantialist ontological imagination of Newtonian physics. Um, and Kant's all Kantian apparatus of enunciation emphasizes certainty and immutability. You know, his work on international that has been adopted by international relations, perpetual peace, uh, so perpetual universal history, moral law, uh, non-contingent and perfect source of morality and duties, and duty and morality must be as certain as a mathematical demonstration. So we see all of this uh, very certainty at, attempt to 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 achieve an absolute certainty and universalities of laws, uh, moral laws, right? That are abstracted from contingency, and they are they are the more perfect, the more are abstracted by contingency, and the more they lift human being from nature. And by doing this, they bring them closer to to the plan that God has devised for for human beings. Um, so uh, perpetual peace then for Kant may be instituted by, by constructing an ethical community of well-disposed human beings in charge of interpreting uh, God's will. And this is politi this political ethos, in my view, has a very dark side because it's based upon the presupposition that a group of people um, mostly men in Kantian imaginary uh, can legitimately claim to embody a true immutable virtue and offer a truthful interpretation of what a good society should look like and, and translate it, you know, and make a politics accordingly. So I find this quest for certainty very troubling. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, this idea, this, this attempt to ground morals on, on certainty is based upon very strong ontological assumption about who we are um, as human beings. And uh, um, the categorical imperative excises contingency uh, and presupposes universal applicability. Uh, as I mentioned before, it relies upon the idea that the world is a Newtonian space. And uh, um, and again, uh, it may also end up relieving subjects from assuming responsibility for the practical consequences of their action, because what counts in this, uh, in this imaginary is an abstract humanity, not the actual human being that exists now. There is a divine pl plan that needs to be brought about. And you know, the temporality is not a human one, is, 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 is a, a, an infinite temporality. So, um, I, I argue that uh, the political rationality of international intervention is based upon this uh, uh, presupposition. And, uh, um, and I argue that this kind of framing ethics is at the basis and is, is at the basis of a lot of our moral failure in, you know, in international intervention as well as development. Okay, now I, uh, you know, in my last uh, three slides, I will try to um, present an alternative, uh, an alternative that is rooted upon um, the ontological critique of, um, of Newtonian foundations through a quantum ontology. Uh, this, slide is this slide is called Rethinking Ethics for a Complex World. Um, so Alexander Wendt, who pioneered quantum social sciences in international relations in his 2015 book, has argued that while atomism tends to promote individualism and competition, an ontology of entanglement may nurture cooperation and open new avenues for agency. 
So by radically questioning the notion of separability that underlines in images of individuality, rationality, and universal normativity, quantum ontologies pave the way for devising uh, a new horizon for ethics um, where that can embrace uncertainty and complexity that doesn't need to be rooted upon this um, quest for an abstract certainty, an ethic that is grounded in humanity and in the practices of humanity. Um, so in this rethinking ethics through quantum, the notion of apparatus is central for reimagining how we fit in the world and exert agency in it. So the tools we use, the political tools we use, the political languages we use, the way we frame problems are relevant because they produce actually consequences. They're not just, um, they don't leave the world undisturbed. The way we imagine ourselves relating to other beings, and I think this will link directly to, to what Karen will tell us about agency, but the way we, we, we think we fit in the world shapes uh, consequences, shapes the world as well. And, uh, and uh, it just does not conserve only us, conserve the, the world as a whole. So in a world of entanglement also, we are invited to rethink our, our self as subject. Subjectification takes the place of substantialist characterization of humans as ontologically endowed with rationality and freedom. We are entangled with, constituted and transformed by the very processes we, processes we aim to shape. In a world of entanglement, the classical notion of agency as power prevalent in international relations, that is the ability to make others do what they would not otherwise have done, comes under questions. As human, we don't act upon the world by applying forces of push and pull, but instead we produce diffractive ontological effects that we only partially control. As quantum subject, we are relational being unequally immersed in a world endowed with morphogenetic properties we contribute to shape. And uh, both the I argue that both the liberal assumptions that we are ontologically free and reasonable being and the Marxist assumptions of alienation by which such ontological freedom is crushed by the capitalist economic system come under question. Uh, they are oversimplification in this framework. We are entangled and we relate differently to different uh, contextual configurations uh, we are immersed with. Um, so what are the consequences of adopting a quantum view on ethics? So this slide is, this slide is called Raising the Bar, Opening Up Possibilities for Agency. Raising the bar, why? I argue that in this framework, ethical decisions may not be adjudicated merely upon, but based upon abstractions, but, but they must take into account the morphogenetic properties of practices and the importance of careful evaluation of complexities. Uh, morphogenetic means the possibility of generate new world, the possibility of create new realities. Um, how questions, as Michel Foucault has also suggested, are central, both analytically and practically. We cannot utter abstract ethical statements if we don't take in, in careful consideration the tools we're gonna use to bring about the aspiration we are uttering. Um, and I feel very strongly about it because as being, for having been a peacekeeper for 10 years, I've always witnessed a lot of abstract aspiration that were not matched by uh, the right tools or enough tools or commitment by member states of the organization, for instance. I also argue that the quest for stable foundation, substantialist assumption um, about humans and nature and linear representation of causality stifle creative political imaginary. <laughs> In the quantum ontological imaginary, uncertainty is not the limit, but the very condition of possibility of ethical choices. And this you know, arcs back to, to Peter's introduction at the beginning, the notion of imaginary is important, the notion of creation, um, the notion of making reality, imagining different possibilities than what we have uh, so far, so far been able to, to imagine. This is politically very relevant. Um, as a conclusion, and before I, you know, I, I pass the, 
the floor to Karen. Um, the main elements that I want to bring home from this presentation are, um, again, the fact that the quantum ethics both raises the bar and opens up possibility for agency. So we cannot rely on ab abstract principles. We cannot appease ourselves with abstract principle. We can also not think that we are omnipotent. So we cannot just imagine that we shape, we can shape the world that our in image, like many idealists in international relations have done. But we need to uh, be aware that through everyday practices, we may bring about forms of materialization of matters that are enduring. Causality in a quantum framework is not reversible. It tends to, we, quantums tend to think about cascade effects. Um, ethics exceeds code and must, codes and must and rules and abstraction and must rely on responsibilities for the apparatuses we choose to employ. Knowledge itself is performative and is embedded in apparatuses and therefore is politically relevant. Small action may have important cascade effects and creativity, critique, responsibility and competence and prudence are ethical virtues that, um, that uh, should be exerted in practice. Um, and with this, um, I'm sure there are a lot of questions. I'm sure there are a lot of things I didn't explain fully, but um, I will stop for now. And thank you. And uh, yeah, <laughs> that's all. Very good, Laura. Thanks uh, so much for this input. I think um, if no one else, I would have a few um, clarification questions, but I think we'll give the floor directly to Karen O'Brien and uh, make sure we have time for everything. So go ahead, Karen, it's, it's to you. Great, thank you. And thank you, Peter, for inviting me tonight to um, speak about this quantum social change. And Laura, thanks for your wonderful presentation that's really laid the groundwork for how like, how I've been inspired by your work and Karen Barad's and others. So let me share my screen and I will walk you through. Let me just get the PowerPoint up. And Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, that's good. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm gonna talk about um, following up with um, on what Laura said, really looking at what does like quantum social science and the um, concepts and ideas from quantum physics add to our understandings about how we respond to climate change. And I understand that you had a special lecture on climate change a few weeks ago and, um, and it's really been my entry point for looking at different paradigms and different ways of thinking about the world and how we show up in the world. And so I want to just kind of bring this exactly to the theme of your course on managing risk and ask this question about how can we generate quantum social change. For me, um, after spending decades working on like climate impacts, vulnerability and adaptation and the implications for your human security, it becomes really clear that, um, that rather than just focusing on mitigation and adaptation to climate change, we really have to focus on transformations. So the question that really drives my research is how do we transform at the rate, the scale, the speed and the depth that is called for by quantum um, by, by, um, the, by climate science and global change research. So, um, so this really brings out the question of, you know, how do we do it in an ethical, equitable and sustainable manner? And um, you know, I think that Laura just talked about the importance of those, you know, how we show up ethically and responsibly. And many of you have probably, you know, after in the follow-up to the um, COF meeting in Glasgow, you know, you've seen this is from the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that really emphasize that the choices we make will lead to different future um, outcomes. And with substantial mitigation, we see a world of about 1.5 degrees um, to two degrees warmer. Um, and that is dangerous climate change for many people, groups, species. So that is not a trivial change as we see um, in the we read about in the news every day today. But without additional mitigation, you see that map on the right with um, temperatures of three degrees to 
um, nine degrees at the poles. And, and that is really a non-analog where we cannot even imagine that. And so for me, the message that comes out with high confidence from the synthesis report um, in 2014 was without additional mitigation efforts beyond those in place today, and even with adaptation, warming by the end of the 21st century will lead to high to very high risk of severe widespread and irreversible impacts globally. So basically, you know, this is, is really saying that, you know, we have, it's, it's not about whether we can transform, but it really is about how we can transform. And, um, Risk has been a, a core concept within the um, climate change community and the um, IPCC assessments. And they, they talk about it as the potential for consequences where something of value is at stake and where the outcome is uncertainty, uh, is uncertain, recognizing the diversity of values. And so when we really have uncertain outcomes where we ourselves are creating the risks that we're responding to, we need to start to think about, you know, how do we think about ourselves in relation to these risks? And as, as Laura really um, outlined, we, we're still in a very much a um, us versus them paradigm. And I don't know how many of you know the game of risk. It's the game of global domination where you accumulate armies to take over different parts of the world. And it really is um, almost a, um, you know, it's a perfect example of a paradigm of um, individualism, of, um, of competition, of, of really us versus them. And I think that that very paradigm is what is killing us, you know, what is really adding to the risks that we're facing today. So when we look at the risks that we're facing, and this is a, um, about key regional key risks and potentials for risk reduction. And I'll go through this a little bit um, more in detail, but we start to see what risk, look like, risk looks like in the present, in the near term, and under different scenarios of long-term risk under two degrees or four degrees warming. And you can see with each of these figures or diagrams that we see um, based on expert judgment and the, the state of the science that, that there is some risk that we can adapt to, um, to reduce risk, but there's also risks that we're not going to be able to adapt to. And I think that we see whether it's the risks for ecosystems, whether it's increased damages from wildfires or increased mass coral bleaching and mortality or human related heat mortality or reduced crop productivity and livestock and food security, or reduced water availability and increased flooding and landslides, you start to see that what's at stake is enormous in terms of our capacity to adapt. There are limits to adaptation, there are barriers to adaptation. So in my research, I'm looking at adaptation as adapting to the very idea that we can transform society and transform um, outcomes for a more sustainable um, future. So, you know, here in Europe, we can start to see that these are playing out actually right here and right now in terms of um, what we can expect. And we see this all over the world where extreme events really are um, not, we're not keeping up with adaptation to current um, climates. And so when we talk about the idea of a four degree warmer world and approach that still from this very um, some separate us versus other world, we see that we're failing again and again and again to actually take actions collectively to move towards the, um, the sustainable de development goals or even meeting the, um, the goals of the Paris Agreement um, to limit warming to two degrees and ideally 1.5 degrees. So for me, this is, you know, the stakes are so high and the time we are in the decade that matters. So how do we really start to think differently about um, let me get, um, uh, how do you know how do we come at climate change and social change through um, in a different way? And probably about ten years ago, I came across quantum social science, and I thought, wow, this is really interesting. And it raised a lot of questions about some of the assumption I and others hold. And I thought, what if we were to reconsider our collective capacity to re reduce risk and vulnerability through a quantum lens? And this opened a real, really interesting and I think exciting inquiry because, you know, what if we are underestimating our capacity for social change by basing our understanding of society on a very classical Newtonian deterministic atomistic and reductionist um, view of the world. And so, you know, how are, if we're misrepresenting the relationship between individual collect change, collective change and systems change, 
could we actually, you know, like amplify our agency for um, change transformations to sustainability? So, um, as Laura said, that you know, quantum mechanics has challenged the worldview um, in many ways over the last hundred years, and it's forced physicists to reshape their ideas of reality, to rethink the nature of things, and at the deepest level, and to revise their concepts of position and speed as well as their notions of cause and effect. And often it's been just assumed that this is valid only for you know, subatomic particles, electrons and photons and gluons and leptons, et cetera, and that it has no relevance at all for the macro world of the macro social world that, um, that we live in. Where, um, and there's, it's certainly true that um, classical physics, you know, rain, snow melts at certain temperatures, um, sea levels rise, you know, we live in this world, but what if there are quantum properties and principles that are um, taking place, including through the language that we speak? And um, in quantum biology, they're really showing that things like our sense of smell and photosynthesis and um, bird navigation are influenced by quantum proce um, processes. And quantum mechanics is considered normal, and it's the world that it describes that is weird. And I think that takes us to really open up our mind and to think, what if, what if we're not actually seeing um, reality as it is? And physicists will be happy to say that reality is not what it seems. And I think what we're trying to say is, what if social reality is not what it seems? And um, like Laura, I've been inspired by the research that's been coming out in um, quantum social science. And Alexander Wentz, Quantum Mind and Social Science, um, points out that if human beings really are quantum, then classical social science is essentially founded on a mistake and social life will require, therefore require a quantum framework for its proper understanding. And, um, and so he really digs in and says, yeah, you know, what, if we, what if we are wrong in the way we've developed social science? And that has important implications for meaning. Um, Karen Barad's work, with Laura, which Laura talked about, really challenges us to think different about matter, not just as a substantial thing, but a doing, a congealing of agency through which phenomena come to matter. And, uh, and I think this is also really exciting. If we think of ourselves as mattering in every moment, then um, the qualities we bring to every moment really do matter. And um, bringing in Laura's work, which has also inspired me on you know, how to think about agency and especially political agency. You know, she emphasizes um, that if we conceive of knowledge as part of entangled processes of intervening in the world and think of concepts and the activity of theorizing as tools for generating ways of engaging the world and fixing some problem, then knowledge is a form of political agency and a way of practicing ethics. So I think that you know, seeing all of these different ideas that are kind of bubbling forward and saying like, okay, if we have a problem like climate change, if we really have 10 years to address it, what if we thought differently about relationship you know, between to ourselves, to each other, to nature, to politics, to the future, and to change itself? So my starting question really is, can insights from quantum physics and quantum social science inspire social transformations that are not only rapid and effective, but equitable, ethical, and sustainable? And, um, and so that's been my starting point for this inquiry. And I go through, um, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a, um, a wonderful collaboration with a Norwegian artist named Tone Bjordam, who, um, who has been able to, in working with her in a very, um, iterative process, she really um, almost can take these abstract ideas and put it into a world, into a, um, a format that um, uh, it might, may be easier to understand than abstract ideas that I talk about. So I'm going to just present and talk to some of the artwork that Tona has presented here. And I'm not going to go through the entire book because I really do look at um, paradigms, beliefs, relationships, consciousness, metaphors, entanglement, um, fractals, you, and, and getting to the point of why you matter more than you think. Um, the idea of quantum social change, um, as I've thought about it, really describes a conscious, nonlinear, and non-local approach to transformations that is grounded in our inherent oneness. Um, it recognizes that we are entangled through language, meaning, and shared context, and that our deepest values and intentions are potential sources of individual change, collective change, 
and systems change. And this recognition when expressed through a particular quality of agency, as Laura talked about, can shift systems and culture in a manner that is both equitable and sustainable. So this idea that there is a different way for us to approach social change that is nonlinear and non-local, I think is um, the non-local dimension really um, changes the way we can think of ourselves in terms of mattering. And so I talk about paradigms and beliefs and the role that they play in, um, you know, in determining quantum social change. And um, moving, I, I don't have like one particular interpretation of quantum physics, but I just really try to show that um, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, is it um, the Copenhagen interpretation? Is it the many um, worlds interpretation? Is it quantum Bayesianism? But all of them really, you know, have still not looked at what it means for society. And these views really link to relational paradigms um, and relationships matter. For many of us, um, as I mentioned, you know, our relationship to self, to other, to nature have been influenced by the enlightenment worldview where we assume um, individualism, atomism, determinism, um, and so on. And where classical systems are very much um, based on causality, where something causes something else, quantum systems are relationships that are non-local. They're characterized by entanglement, by uncertainty, by indeterminism, and by potentiality. And so, as Laura described, it's our relationships are not interactions of separate, you know, hard, massy substances, but they're intra-actions in one entangled whole system. And to me, this really gets at this idea that we don't actually have the language nor the grammar to describe the relationship between I and we, or what I would bracket as I, we, or parts and wholes, or, you know, whole parts. We're, you know, the both and dimensions of this, um, this type of reality really are hard for us to, to, um, to experience and, um, and communicate in a very classical world. And so that I think is something where when we start to look at the language, language we have for social change, we start to think that it is still very much, you know, influenced with by remnants of um, the, the um, world of, um, of the enlightenment and classical Newtonian physics. Um, when we start to look beyond just the, the meanings of, of quantum physics and look at the metaphors, we start to see that um, metaphors are what create our reality. The language we use actually influences the world that we are um, seeing and living in. And quant um, climate change makes a lot of use of metaphors, whether it's the greenhouse effect or um, you know, carbon footprints or hothouse earth or whatever. And um, studies of the metaphors used in climate change show that many of them are still very um, us versus them, cost and benefit, and they really lead to an economistic interpretation of social change. So if new metaphors have the power to create a new reality as um, Mark Johnson, as um, George Lakoff and Mark Johnson have proposed, then what if we were to use metaphors like quantum leap? or superpositions or potentiality? And could they open up new ways of thinking about social change and help us to tell new stories about social change? Because right now, a lot of our stories are very um, apocalyptic and dystopian about the future. They don't actually include that sense of individual and collective agency and political agency being entangled. And so um, I can talk a little bit about that and about that call, you know, like how do we really, how do we tell different stories um, and use a different language for that? But one story I do want to emphasize is that, you know, we often think of entanglement as a metaphor in, um, Often in everyday language, we look at it as twisted or tied together, but um, entanglement is much more than a metaphor. It really is the nature of reality and the nature of the, the universe, as Karen Barad um, points out. And I think this is something that um, it's um, that we really have to um, start to grasp that it doesn't involve causality. It involves correlation or co-relation. It's about our relationships that um, being non-local and um, and therefore that when you measure one thing, you actually get information about um, another part of that system. And um, 
whereas in quantum physics, it's about measurements in, you know, and noise in the measurements. Um, quantum social science recognizes that we are entangled through language and meaning as well. And Alexander Wentz's work really shows that language is a quantum, as he would argue, a quantum social phenomena, where through speech acts, through listening, we are kind of collapsing a wave of um, possibility or potential meanings into an actual reality. So when we suddenly talk about public-private partnerships or um, net carbon zero or you know net zero carbon things, we're starting to like enact a world and create material um, manifestations of that world through our institutions, through our regulations, through new measurement devices and things. And so, so it really does actually matter how we are, that we are entangled. Um, and that brings us then to the issue of consciousness, because consciousness is um, something that, um, it, you know, it matters more than we think. But often within at least global change science, we downplay the role of consciousness, free will, and um, personal responsibility or responsibility, our ability to respond. Um, there's no consensus on what consciousness is or where it's located in the body or how it can be measured or if it's like the nature of all existence, et cetera. Um, but what's interesting to me is that we don't even consider consciousness as a, um, you know, in global change research and looking at climate change. And many people are calling for, oh, we need a new consciousness, but what exactly does that mean in practice? And um, we talk about the atmosphere, we talk about the biosphere, we talk about the hydrosphere, the cryosphere, but we don't talk very much about the noosphere or the sphere of human consciousness um, and mental activity, especially in relation to the biosphere. And to me, one of the most profound aspects of the so-called Anthropocene um, epic, you know, the idea that we are influencing the, um, the um, universe at geological scales is that we are becoming self-aware that we are imp um, influencing this system. And when one part of an entangled system becomes self-aware that it is um, influencing others, then the whole system changes. And I think that's where a lot of um, possibility lies. And that brings us then to agency because as Laura pointed out, agency matters. Transformations to sustainability will not happen just through like optimism and hope or wishful thinking. They call for interventions that actually challenge the outdated systems and the structures that have actually generated um, a world that of um, pollution, of dispossession, of, um, of the, you know, the world that we're seeing right out there. Um, Karen Barad's work really emphasizes that we are constantly interacting with the universe and that our interactions matter because each one of them reconfigures the world. And then this idea that you know, we are mattering in every moment has huge implications for how we show up in relation to climate change, biodiversity loss, and other challenges. And I would say that you know, agency is not neutral. It's agency that actually helped create the Anthropocene and the problems we're facing today. So I'm interested in a quality of agency, um, an agency that is actually linked to values that apply to the whole, to an entangled quantum social organism or system or universe and everything. And those are, you know, equity, justice, dignity, compassion, things that, that have to be kind of part of that whole. And I think that when we start to link our agency to ethics, to values, then, then we start to see a different quality of social change. And that quality, um, I think, can be described as fractal patterns or um, pattern, self-similar patterns that repeat at all scales. And this idea of fractals, you know, David, um, physicist David Bohm um, talked, about, talked about it. And it's, it's, a, it's an idea that it, we see in algebra, in geometry, and also in nature. But social fractals are a little bit different, whether we're talking about fractal politics or fractal cities, they actually embed the values that, um, of, you know, what we want to see uh, um, repeated at all scales. So when we're thinking about quantum fractals, we're thinking about non-local um, idea, like non-local patterns that are actually context specific, but arising in different areas and in different um, ways. And to me, that is really the, at the heart of quantum social change is can we actually disrupt old patterns and generate new ones that contribute to a, um, not just local change, not just global change, but change across scales. 
And pulling these different perspectives together, it really, you know, you come to the conclusion that you matter, I, we matter, that we matter a lot more than we think. Um, it's really about, you know, from a quantum perspective that um, we matter in every moment and agency is really an entangled interacting phenomena. Um, whether it's, um, you know, the outcomes of our intentions and actions affect all of us. And we also all have the, the, the capacity, every single one of us to consciously interact and in doing so transform our individual and shared reality. So for me, quantum social change involves consciously contributing to equitable and a thriving world in every moment, recognizing that we matter. And while this sounds very abstract, it actually has to take place in the real world, in the classical world that we're living. And a lot of my work on transformations to sustainability looks at these three spheres of transformation that are always intra interacting or intra-acting. And these are the practical, the political, and the personal spheres. And when we look at the way we're addressing climate change right now, it is very much through the practical sphere. It's through um, behaviors and technical responses. It's the fix it's It's the world out there um, um, being changed. We often forget about the political sphere, the systems, the structures, the social and cultural norms, rules, expect, um, expectations, institutions, et cetera, that influence those practical spheres. And we very rarely connect those with the beliefs, the values, the worldviews, and paradigms that are both individual and shared, and that influence how we see, how we relate to systems, how we, you know, basically everything that Laura and I have been talking about, talking about, that it's not that the world is out there, but it's that we're remaking it in every moment and that outcome, we are these fractals of the practical, political, and personal sphere. And when we act, not just from an a point of understanding, but as the entry point from the values that, uh, that, that apply to the whole system, we start to see that we can actually create change at all scales. So if we think of this, and this comes from a, um, um, the powers of 10 framework of Mark McCaffrey, that if we start to think of ourselves as the individual 10 to the one, that we are entangled with friends and families, personal networks, communities, villages and neighborhoods, meta communities, urban areas, all the way up to all homo sapiens who have ever lived, we start to see that our capacity for change is not just very small and local, but that everything we do actually is resonating and having ripple effects. We may have a particular sphere of influence in our community or in our urban area or nation state, but all of those changes, how we show up in the moment really matters. And so um, what I often get when I talk about quantum social change is, what does quantum social change mean in practice? And I think the answer really is um, exactly where Laura ended her talk, that the, the answer lies in the question itself in that practice matters. You know, it is about how we are, how we show up and um, you know, how we work for social change. So if we can activate a quality of agency by responding from the space of integrity and oneness in every moment, I think we will see that these quantum leaps to sustainability can happen much faster than we think. But I think it's only when people realize that they matter a lot more than they think. So I will stop sharing there and... Um... Lovely, thank you so much, Karen, for your talk. And thanks again to Laura. Um, the floor is open. Uh, just indicate your interest with a hand raise or a note in the chat. And I can stop asking <clears throat> a couple of ped pedagogical questions, really, because um, I think uh, this material is going to be relatively foreign to to some of the students. What I mean, what is the? Um, it's a big question. Sorry, but uh, it's still early. What is the methodological status? of quantum social uh, theory. I mean, what is, what is it doing? And here is, here's, a, here's, I'll give it ABC choice. And you can tell me if you like one or you want to add your own. Um, one is it's a, a kind of, well, one it's, it's literal. And I think Alexander Wendt actually says sometimes in his book that there's actual uh, quantum physics going on in in, um, in cognitive uh, states and cognitive relations and in social theory. So it's actually literally an application of 1930s uh, quantum physics. I mean, it, he doesn't always do that, I think, and that's a, another problem, but, but uh, there's, um, there's a very literal in, interpretation. So he has this famous quote, 
uh, uh, what is how does it go? You, you mentioned it, Laura. I think uh, we're we're walking wave functions. Human beings are walking wave functions. A wave function is this fundamental quantum theoretical idea that uh, um, that the reality of our reality uh, uh, varies with like the way light waves in the same sort of logic. So there's one. There's point. There's uh, selection A. Uh, selection B would be then it's an analogy. Um, that that is to say that uh, things that we do when we're talking about as social scientists, as uh, activists, things that we do have some structural similarities with quantum theory. And then uh, uh, choice C would be something more like it's a metaphor, which is close to an analogy, but the, that really the different points in the theory can map onto you know, other kinds of things in, in, in practice. So if you follow my question, could you give us a stab at where you, and I'm not, I wonder if you, you're on the same level, you two. So could you give a stab at explaining where you actually relate towards quantum physics or where you think the relationship between quantum social theory and quantum physics lies? Laura, go ahead. I go ahead, okay. Well, <laughs> this is a big question, and I think not all uh, quantum social theorists use quantum the same way. So mm -hmm. I think that Alex went makes a strong claim that reality, human reality, human beings are quantum. And based upon this, he makes his theory of consciousness. There are others who use quantum as a translation of current concepts, for instance, in international relations theory, recently for the special issue that, you know, Peter, we are together with in, uh, Michael Murphy used waves to describe the problem, as you know, of uh, um, structural violence. So instead of describing a structure with a, with a specific organizing principle that acts upon individuals that are so constrained by the structures, it talks about interfering waves that may amplify or cancel each other. And this is a very much more probabilistic way of looking at the problem of agency and structures. So through translating, Karen has talked a lot about language, language matters. Mm -hmm. And I really liked hearing this uh, from her so clearly uttered. So if we think about social phenomena instead of structure and people crushed by structure or structures and individual. If we, talk, if we talk about this as interfering waves, maybe we see something else. Maybe we open up different possibility for agency. So it could be a, a translation, right? A translation that however has practical implication. Mm -hmm. For me, the way I use it, and I think that it, there is a lot to be said here. It's, it's a, it's a, so it's, this is a very interesting question, Peter, and thank you for this because it points at how much we still have to do about, you know, in this kind of field. Um, the way I, I used quantum in my book and in my publishing so far has been as an ontological critique. So I talk about imaginaries because I don't, I don't make a claim about what reality is. I make a claim of what if we accept the possibility that it may not be what it seems and we open up to a different way of looking and we try to use a different language, what is that we discover? But I don't make, again, I follow, you know, Bohr actually said, okay, if we accept quantum, we need to, to accept that reality may really not be, you know, as intuitive as we have learned from Newtonian physics. I never expect I never I never did a quantum experiment myself, but I think this view of reality is extremely generative politically, and as a political scientist, is what I'm interested in. Oh, very interesting. Thank you. Right. Yeah, yeah, I, I follow up on that because I think that um, yeah, in some ways, all of the above because I think there it can be powerful as a metaphor, but also in terms of its meaning and um, and also the methods, the methods of um, that have been developed from quantum physics and things are being used in um, quantum decision making and quantum game theory. And I didn't even know I use I use a mixed method called Q methodology in my research to look at um, you know how people's beliefs and attitudes are. I didn't realize that that actually comes from quantum, and that is you know from the 1930s it was developed as a um, a way of looking 
being able to almost what that looks like what q methodology yeah yeah it's based on a likert scale you find like all the possible beliefs that for example young people you know what people think about climate change and then you extract them down to maybe 32 statements and you have people sort them on a grid um a likert scale where you know from highly agree to highly disagree and they can only agree with like one or two and then oh, highly disagree with others and and so you're really doing then a, um you're you're doing a correlation between the statements to find out what are the subjective attitudes that people have and um to um the like two of the key authors of a textbook, Watson Center, they've really looked at the relationship to quantum. There's been some recent articles that because um, Stevenson, when he developed this in the 30s, it was at a time when quantum physics was coming out. And it was really like that, that it, it relates very well with this idea that there's all these possibilities, but they become real when you in the moment. And the, they might be that when I ask you to sort this you know tonight you'll do it one way and tomorrow in a different context you'll do it differently so but it's not you that it's measuring it's the it's the statements and what are the big the bigger statements like, so so methodologically it's i think really important but for me the most important thing in terms of you know like education and everything it really opens up an inquiry as laura just talked about you know that, that it asks us questions and it asks us to really think about you know some of the assumptions that we have and that's where i think the power lies in that and i'm always you know because you put quantum in front of everybody every anything and people just go oh woo woo this woo woo that you know quantum healing quantum this one but i think that you know when you start to do and i almost am in a habit of look doing google searches on quantum physics and the news and you start to see that the science itself is saying that wow you know molecules of you know like giant molecules are entangled or that we're we're starting to see that you know we can show um, what they've theorized 30 years ago that reality does not exist at the local level and things and i think that it's really you know, it kind of gives us this thing of like wow the science is telling us what indigenous knowledge traditions what wisdom traditions you know it's kind of this convergence and, and people will say oh we don't need physical science you know to validate social science or we don't need um you know the so the um Physics, physics shouldn't be done that, but I think just just to open our minds to questions is super important. Hmm. I see. There's a question from my good colleague Danielle. Go ahead, Danielle. If you want. Well, uh, thank you, Peter. Thank you for the presentations. They're extremely interesting, and I'm, I'm quite. I am a huge fan of the quantum uh, approach in social sciences, but also the new materialisms by Karen Barrett. I was thinking just um, the critique that some some scholars pose to this approach. Despite I'm really into this kind of uh, research, I think that it's also important to uh, share the light sources from um, certain doubts or critiques. And usually they say, you know, it's in, when we remain a uh, level of abstractions concerning, you know, imaginary imaginary signification that could reshape our reality. Uh, and we still remain at an ontological level, they, this approach could uh, give extremely important insight in your perspective. But when we need to go deep in applied ethics, uh, computational ethics, bioethics, uh, there's sometimes no a lack of principle, uh, or in other terms, uh, the deontological and consequentialistic approach still remain the, the most no, uh, considered useful uh and um a kind of ethics that try to be applied in specific uh, case and so we're thinking that uh what do you think as regarding this critics because i have the chance to working on a labs that work on computational ethics and they talk just only on uh consequentialistic approach or the ontological ones because uh, by the end, the, the main assumptions and the main concepts are quite easy to modelize uh, and logically modelize. Um, so I'm, I'm really, up, I'm, I think that this kind of perspective is full of uh, extremely precious uh, assumptions, but sometimes I have the impression that you still need a lot of work on a sort of you know, construction of principle uh that are uh, that could be applied in the real life in the applied ethics you know I, when we talk about um uh, responsibility for example you no know, i was thinking about uh, the social connection model of responsibility by iris mario young that's it 
arise from another context, but by the end open to a new concept of responsibility that is more trans individual than intersubjective. But uh, that's, that's basically the question is this, uh, the, the human liberal argument know that we are individual and we are, we are an agency that is grounded in our free will. Uh, it's easy uh, when we, to modelize and by the end it's full of certain principles that could be useful in apologetic. But these files of um, research, uh, they produce certain ethics, but I think, you know, affirmative ethics by Braidotti. It's extremely interesting, but by then it's, it's difficult to apply. And I don't want to say that, no, that's the, the biggest problems between continental and analytical philosophy, philosophical traditions, but sometimes I have the impressions that it's extremely, extremely um, still answered in uh, how we, we could reshape our reality and the imaginary level, but a lot of work must be done in uh, to apply this perspective in, especially in apolitics, but that's just, uh, I don't know, I've tried to be clear, but, uh, and the other, just another thing, the other aspect, of course, I think that our Western countries are grounded in certain traditions that is a neoliberal traditions that usually um, use um, evolutionary perspective in a certain way, not in a proper way, and of course, this quantum perspective is extremely um, um, not against, but create a sort of no. I always found a certain discrepancy between the, the certain evolutionary conceptions and the, the quantum uh, perspective. But that's another point. So, uh, so thank you for your presentation. It was very really interesting. Thank you, Daniel. Anybody want to go ahead? No. All right, we can leave it there. Karen, go ahead. Oh, oh no, no, I was going to let you, Laura, because because it was about ethics. I think that I think maybe if you take the ethics part, and then I can take the a lot of work needs to be done part. <laughs> okay. Okay. So about the ethics part, um, I hear different uh, trajectories in your question. It's a very complex one, so I'm not sure I will, you know. I will address all of its um, various elements, but there are two things that I would like to share very briefly. Um, you seem to be inquiring about the applicability of, so how this can become an applied ethics. And what seems to me is that the very, so what Karen has said about language to me is very relevant, the developing of different concepts for adjudicating ethics or ethical behavior. One thing that Karen Barad has started inquiring about and I put as a central element in my book is the notion of responsibility. And I conclude with a critique of some international interventions, both in development and in peacekeeping, by showing that the driving concept was not responsibility towards the recipients of those, in, of those intervention, but that it was basically bureaucratic thinking following rules and abstractions. So if we think that responsibility towards the recipient is the central justification, we ask our politi politicians and international organizations to demonstrate they're able to carry about has as the public, then accountability looks different, right? N then nobody can talk about unintended consequences so lightheartedly. There are, it's very difficult to claim unintended consequences when you exert responsibility. And, and but, but this is not the fault of the UN or the UN is not a person. You know, if we, we accept in the political discourse that is not abstraction and principle, but is responsibility. So you say you're gonna do a certain job, do it, don't pretend you are doing it just by pretending that you apply cookie cutter solutions to very complex situation and then you pack up and go because it's not your problem anymore. That's what really you know, triggered me ethically as a peacekeeper. So I think that changing the framework, changing what is considered political acceptable, politically acceptable and how we keep, how we keep politicians accountable for the discourses um, they make and the promises they make is important. Another thing you talked about um, 
computational ethics. And this, you know, this idea just came to my mind. So it can be completely bogus, but I would love to share it. So quantum computers are being used to do biosimulations, right? To, to, to explore a number of, of possibilities that are not defined at the beginning and how different scenarios would come out from, uh, uh, from different inputs and different, uh, um, for instance, uh, uh, genetic transformation for different epidemiological configurations and so on and so forth. And why not trying to use computers to elaborate specifically on ethical decision by using quantum computer to show different configuration that would come out in different chains of events. So embracing this complexity and help computer to let us see how different consequences of our decision-making, action, vocabulary, et cetera, could come about. And this is maybe completely you know, my dream at 7.30 PM. But <laughs> since you asked this question, I just felt free to, to imagine something. <laughs> And wouldn't, I wouldn't, that, wouldn't that make uncertainty impossible then? It wouldn't that uh, destroy the uncertainty? Well, would it destroy uncertainty or there would be probabilistic outcomes of different scenarios? Okay. I mean, do, do we need to have certain outcomes or probabilities assigned? Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Aaron, do want to go? yeah, I'll just kind of go off on that because I think it's really important. I like working with climate change and you know the, the integrated assessment models that are predicting the future and telling us that we have a 5% chance of limiting climate change to a two degrees by the end of this century. There's a lot of assumptions in those models. There's a lot of things that are, are um, included and excluded. Often it's like technology, population, affluence, um, you know, very measurable things, but not the subjectivity, not changing values, worldviews, and beliefs, different, um, different ways of seeing um, and relating to the world. And to me, that's the, um, the thing, because we can say we, in a very like abstract way that, oh yes, we need to, you know, we need to first, you know, find quantum brain theory has to be proven. And this is gonna take us, this is all very speculative and it's gonna take us 50, 60 years before the science catches up. And then we actually can, you know, see that we are walking wave functions or that we have this potentiality or something. And, and I think if we actually throw ourselves into the future and look back, you know, like say, well, what were we missing in 2021? What was actually stopping that? And I think that it was still that like, at the very least, looking at the language we use in the us and other. And I find myself always doing it. How do I connect to people with very different worldviews from me that really are like, you know, in a, in a different world. And then I realized like, oh, wait, what we're saying is that we are connected. We are entangled. How do we connect through values that from that space? And it's not a intellectual space, but it's, it's that it goes into those, you know, values that apply to everyone, equity, justice, how do you find out what really matters to other people and, um, and connect there to, to generate those different conversations. So for me, this is not, this is, is really about like, well, how do we show up right here and right now, if we actually take, you know, like quantum social change or quantum social science into, you know, if we, if we experiment with it, in a different way rather than just abstract it and say well let's wait and then we can say we were right we told you so and because yeah i think that um we actually you know like in terms of responsibility it's right here and right now not um not throwing it to 2030 2040. hey there's mark salter nice to see you Nice to see you. Thanks for letting me um, uh, crash the seminar. Thanks, uh, everybody. This has been a really uh, fascinating conversation. I think that rather than think of it as a wager, is this rich metaphorically or true scientifically? I think that a more productive way is to say, what is the cost of living with the Newtonian metaphors, right? I mean, you know, like what are the embedded assumptions within the Newtonian metaphors of agency, causality, force, power, you know, presence that would then blind us to other uh, alternatives. But then my question is, you know, comes from kind of Kuhn. If we accept that paradigm shifts are not simply a matter of scientific truth, but rather the socialization, the social triumph of a particular set of paradigm advocates, right? You know, uh, in addition to the kind of 
intellectual power of the ideas, it's the social power of the advocates for one paradigm or another. How can we make sure, if I'm on team Q, how can we make sure that quantum becomes a paradigm that has purchase and not just like a symbolic interactionism or, you know, like some kind of small minor innovation that goes away. And, uh, you know, I have a kind of part two of this question, which is the point that Karen uh, made at the end of her uh, presentation, which is about the way that quantum seems to have discovered through science what indigenous and traditional knowledge is found through experience. And I find that really striking. Nora Bowman's work on this is super interesting. You know, I, uh, I'm really wrestling with that myself. My question is, how, how do we make that argument in a way that is kind of, um, that has intellectual, interior intellectual integrity, right? Like, you know, I mean, I, I agree with you entirely that we sort of say, oh, look, they come to the same point and we think that the quantum physics is true for all the reasons that Alex says in the experimental data. And we are taking as a value proposition that the indigenous knowledge is kind of true because it has managed to persist over hundreds or thousands of years through different ways of colonization. But is that the same kind of argument at the, at the end? Thanks, thanks so much. I learned a lot from this presentation. It was really provocative and uh, really useful. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. I, mean, I've, I've, uh, I actually have a longer uh, response to the second part of the question. I'll let the guests answer, but I just could uh, 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 add quickly about the Kuhn com comment. I if I'm not mistaken, Kuhn also admits not only that uh, paradigm changes happen because of socialization processes, but also because of uncertainties. So the accidents essentially that happen and that uh, that would also harmonize somewhat with the quantum social theory uh, perspective but go ahead karen and or Laura, if you want to respond to mark salter or do you want to go first or <laughs> you know oh, okay yeah. yeah no i um i think that's really like i think your concern about whether there's actually anything of substance here or whether whether it's just like some trendy quantum you know this or that is is really important and it's going to be i think from a pragmatic perspective how what it actually does how does it actually change anything and i know that alex went is really you know interested in how do we actually change the way we're educating students and you know all the way from you know um through primary school to secondary school like what type of reality are we actually showing people and i think that that um for me it's not so much that saying like quantum physics is right or wrong like i think quantum bayesianism that you know where the, the our beliefs or bets on the system collapse reality into that system is super important and this is really bringing in subjectivity and agency and bringing the science into the equation and it's very much you know it's participatory realism like karen barad's agential realism it you know, for me, I guess I, I'm coming at it not just from like, okay, you know, like these theoretical parts, but what are the practical implications of this? And right now, there's a lot of people who really don't feel like they matter. There's a lot of people who, people who feel way too small, way too insignificant. Like, you know, if I do anything in the name of the environment or this, then it's just going to be washed out by you know, Norwegian fossil fuel investments in the North Sea or, or things like that. And, and I think to empower people and working with like neurosciences, working with public health and the, the idea that mattering matters to us, you know, as human beings, we actually want to feel part of a collective as part of a whole. We are wired to connect in our brains. So, so you can almost say that, well, you don't need quantum physics to tell us that we need, that we are part of a collective and part of a whole. And there's so many parallel ways of saying the same thing and I, I think it's really like, who's the audience? Who is this speaking to? And for me, you know, the like the social sciences and the humanities have been saying a lot of these things. And I think Alexander Wentz's work really gets to that at the end. It's like, it's, it's actually, you know, reinforcing the idea, you know, ideational, like that we actually are, you know, the constructing our world in the moment. And 
for me, it's just a, a really important thing to speak to those scientists who are so who are turning people into objects to be changed. You know, it's like you need to change in the name of climate change, biodiversity loss, and really not activating that sense of agency. Not saying, "Oh, you matter." Saying that you, you know, you. I'm telling you, know, like it's it, it it's a very different use of. Um, or approach to social change. And I think what we see is the failure when you try to change people, whatever good cause you have, you end up with pushback. And to me, it's like activating a sense of not just like, you know, the little agency, but you realize like, wow, non-local, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it is a political move, move that, you know, that whether it's through the language we speak or the ways we are, the way we show up, it's, it, that matters to me, so. Yeah, I will try to add my two cents and I'm very, um, <laughs> Karen, can I use one of your concepts? I think, uh, uh, Mark, your question about how can we be advocates, you know, in the face of social powers that don't think quantum, I think that current notion of fractals that diffractively, you know, propagates from, you know, even small places to different localities uh, is a very powerful one and I think is one worthwhile researching as a metaphor but also as a way of thinking because metaphors are a way of thinking. Science relies on metaphors and metaphors rely on science and there is a cross feeding. So to me, you know, I hope that again, as Karen said, the notion of pedagogy is important. I mean, if I look at the change of what was acceptable when I grew, when I was growing up, uh, to say about women and the way we were subjectified as women and the way we're still subjectified and the way some people still take the liberty of say certain things and speak about us and to us in certain ways. But how much this has been made unacceptable is also very important. And this is a change of language, a change of images about femininity, a change of expectations about you know, who you are and how you become a successful human being. Oh, are you waiting to get married and have children? Or are you gonna get a job? Are you gonna get a professional in your own merit? More and more these languages and social attitudes are changed and they diffractively propagate. So I think we can do the same thing with quantum because it has real potential. About the, and you know, and it's not gonna happen tomorrow. It may take, I mean, time, but we need, we need to try to insist. <laughs> I think another um, about uh, about indigenous thinking. I really love Nora's work, and actually, one of the explorations with others we are trying to undertake is possible convergences with uh, decolonial discourses and indigenous knowledge. I'm not sure they are exactly the same thing. And sometimes, you know, I remember Karen, you got a pushback by a person who asked the question at the talk at Virginia Tech, oh, you're talking about these things, we indigenous people, we got it already, we are on, you know, and, and she was advocating for, so I don't think the matter is to say, this is mine or this is your, but is exactly what Karen said, we can come to different awareness through different, means and it's not it may not be exactly the same language because because everything is contextual but they're not incompatible and they may help each other instead of you know used as you know opposite discourses like feminist and quantum there are relationality is a feminist topic they're not mutually exclusive they illuminate maybe different pieces but i think we should come together instead of creating silos. Thank you. <clears throat> I mean, I could uh, like I said I wanted I wanted to just add a comment there. <clears throat> I, I sort of heard Mark, Mark's second question a little bit differently, um, along the lines of the question of how we stud how we can study uh, traditional thought and experience from a quantum perspective as an alternative to uh, Newtonian Cartesian uh, studying. And my tiny, tiny experience with this was an article I wrote about um, uh, Vedic, Vedic thought. Um, I wasn't the first to come up with this, but I tried to do it in a more, a little bit more uh, detailed and rigorous way than some of the popularized literature about, about new physics. And what, I, what it came down to was that I had to squeeze out every bit of my Cartesian thinking in order to, to, to make the analysis. 
So there was no way to sort of step outside of my Cartesian Newtonian head. And whether it's my head or not, or socialized, we can discuss that too. But I, I was unable, also because I was publishing a, in a Western academic journal, there was no way to step out of that epistemology and methodology and even ontology to, to do the job. And to sort of envisage doing that, sort of not being, not being uh, Cartesian and studying something in a scientific way, you, it, you'd have to sort of just surrender to chance. There would be no system involved. There would be no universal concepts, no abstraction. So it's really, that's sort of the paradox that we cannot really um, manage with what quantum teaches us. It doesn't give us a methodology for doing this. It only just tells us what are the alternatives to certain points, positions and points of view. Karen, I see you have a response. Yeah, no, I think you're right on there in terms of like that it's very hard to step outside of our heads. And I think what it's saying and what where the links are is like to get out of our heads and experience. And that's why when we say practice matters, it's really like, yeah, how do you, you know, how do you connect the head, heart, hands? And that's where a lot of transformative education and transformative learning is actually taking place. And where I think that the quantum paradigm resonates with a lot of people who have experiential knowledge, you know, either they're, you know, there's different ways that, um, you know, you know, practices, whether it's meditation, whether it's, you know, drumming, singing, like there's so many different ways that people kind of come to the same types of conclusion. And then a certain, you know, it, it resonates. And goes, yes, so I'm a walking wave function, not not to be like, in that way thing, but I am, you know, like to see the potentiality that exists here and how it is so much constrained by our um, socialized mind, our, you know, like cultures and things and how we are, you know, like stepping outside. And to me, paradigm shifts can happen very rapidly because, you know, it's not like we're in the, um, the, um, you know, the 1960s where we had to write letters and things where we have access to so much information on the internet and it really is to step outside of the old paradigm really can happen in an instant. And I think more and more people are experiencing that, you know, like they kind of getting it. And I think especially younger people, they're, you know, they tell me like, yeah, we're, we're not, we weren't born in your paradigm. So, you know, it's easier to, mm. to challenge it. Thanks. There, I see Mark Salter's put a uh, reference in the chat. I'll make sure you get uh, the students get that. Yeah, you know, um, if I could just jump in, you know, I think sure. that the, you know, I arrived at this through Latour, you know, where Latour sort of says why, you know, there is an unnatural disconnection between politics and science, and that once we undo the sort of, you know, uh, assignation of science to things and politics to people, then all sorts of new ways become uh, sort of available. And Zoe Todd's critique in this piece is uh, that indigenous roots to knowledge ha did not make that mistake in the 1600s and so have not had this false distinction between science and politics and that one of the concerns that Zoe Todd is, has is the appropriation of indigenous knowledge by Western thinkers. And so Latour gets to be the big man saying, I've discovered that climate is a, is a force. And they say, well, welcome to, you know, like indigenous thought. We've understood that for, uh, for years. And so I know that one of the things I really wrestle with as someone who's trying to engage with indigenous thought and quantum at the same time is precisely how we engage with it in a way that is respectful and kind of ontologically equivalent rather than reproducing extractive knowledge practices. Hmm. Good problem. Yeah, I think that's really important. I have some students who just wrote a paper on like kind of decolonizing research and um, and right the importance of right relations which I mentioned in the book because it really and that's why relationships really do matter and the whole concept of right relations it puts us in you know like all of us to how um, we, we um, yeah how do we relate and there, and I think that you raise some really important issues and and I think also at the, as Laura pointed out like there's so many pathways to the same thing and there's many like many slow learners many slow cultures but but it's almost like that how if we really do need to change rapidly at a, you know and 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 in a with a particular quality then um we actually you know have to think of ourselves more as you know entangled holes and not um 
yeah, I think we have to decolonize our our um, our whole beings and the whole whether it's just you know research and practice and, and decolonize our paradigms in, in many ways. So when you when you use the expression right relations, Karen, then you 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 sort of the um, what do I want to say? So so it's it's de hierarchization of of the mm -hmm. relations of the world. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. it's not only uh, about relations be horizontally to use a Newtonian mm -hmm. idea mm -hmm. about relations mm -hmm. between between observers or activists or 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 researchers, mm -hmm. but also relation between you and the object of your interests. So yeah, I think you know it comes from indigenous cultures that they're you know right relations, me and my relations, and that recognizing we are related to nature, we are related to you know all ancestors and all generations and things. And I think that that when we can enter that type of a space, then um, as researchers, then you know you you have to leave behind a lot of your um, the stuff that we've been trained to you know like you know yeah. to extract knowledge and to publish this and that. But it's really like you come in with a different quality of um, of relations. I'll, I'll try to find the article and put it in the chat because it's. Um... We need to we need to stop at uh, fifty five past the hour sharp because of um, another engagement that uh, Carmen has. I want to, if there's nothing else from the audience, I wanted to sl sneak in one more question about, and it was about uh, Anthropocene that you mentioned, Karen. Sorry, I pronounced your name wrong. Like my wife's name is Karen. So I'm a little bit used to that. Karen. Um, how do you, I mean, you said it, you named it in one sentence that uh, uh, is, is your interpretation of the Anthropocene um, explained by quantum social theory in the sense that it's a way of the world observing itself for the first time in a, in a new way? I mean, certain would say that it's, it's the self-consciousness of the planet. We became aware that we are a planet, we're finite, et cetera. Is that how you read that in relation to quantum or is, was it a different kind of example? Um, I was thinking more in terms of like the role of consciousness, but I think that you, you know, that, that what you said is actually quite interesting because whether you actually look at it as like that we are becoming self or I know that a lot of you know, working on the Anthropocene, you recognize like humanity is doing this, but we also recognize that it's parts of humanity <laughs> that are, have really had a, a negative effect on the planet and that it's not, you know, like not to essentialize humans as the bad, but to start to recognize that this, the, the impacts that we're seeing actually came out of a, a particular mindset and a mind frame that has really, you know, the great acceleration after um, World War II that has, has led, you know, and it has been very much this idea of progress. The, it, it has been the, you know, the enlightenment paradigm has led to, you know, an explosion of fossil fuel use. And so for me, it, you know, just to even get consciousness into the discourse on, you know, we talk about the technosphere, we talk about all these other spheres, but the, the noosphere, it hasn't actually been integrated into this research. There was a book on, you know, the, the noosphere and global change research in like 2000, bringing in all these different traditions, but how do we, um, you know, really bring out those, you know, like, like put that more front and center and it would be great to just start to think of this as if this, if we are in one quantum universe, and then we're becoming self-aware of ourselves as in, you know, James Lovelock and the Gaia hypothesis and things. So it's there's many roads that are telling us that um, you know that the social ecological systems and humans and agency and non-human, you know, there we're. I feel like we're all kind of heading in a certain direction, and I guess I'm um, just looking for ways that we can move faster to go instead of looking for leverage points actually looking at like people not, as the we are the leverage points and that we actually you know like that the systems aren't out there we are the systems that we are the ones that are constantly generating um patterns or you know frag fragments really and that we actually can create these fractal patterns that are uh, much more coherent to a whole and thriving planet very nicely put well, I think on that, we'll close things off. Um, next week is a little bit special. We'll be joined by the students from the Department of International Relations at the University of Sussex. And uh, we'll listen to Stefan Elbe and Anrumer Malder. And the subject will be global governments of sanitary emergencies. 
health emergencies is a better translation. Sorry. Thank you so, so much to, to Karen and to Laura for your time and for your energy and your life. <laughs> and to Daniele Mark, to Anne Mark, thanks for your input to the seminar. And we'll see you next week. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Have a good evening. Thanks. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.